Um, thank you again for joining us for Korean Natural Farming, an introduction to cultivating microorganisms with Benjamin Morgan Dillon. We are really excited to you know, jump into uh, the whole world of a healthy micro, microbiome in the soil. Uh, before we get started on that, just want to say thanks to our sponsors. We have um, been generously supported by all of these great organizations, and we encourage you to support them as well. And when you do, please remind them that you love their support of NOFA. As well, we all want to remember that we are presenting, attending, and hosting this workshop from land that was previously inhabited and prior to European colonization. And as an agriculture organization, we are very, you know, in tune with the land, hopefully, and we want to remember that the land was being used, managed, lived, inhabited, occupied before us. And everything we do is, again, you know, working on the land to hopefully improve it for the people who will come next. And here is a great interactive map for anyone who wants to check it out and learn more about the people who were here before us. And I'll cut and paste that link into the chat in a moment. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Benjamin Hello, everybody. Over. Thank you very much for coming. I really appreciate all of your interest in Korean natural farming and the fascinating world of indigenous microorganisms and plant fermentations. I hope to take you down a very interesting path tonight where you'll get to have a little bit of a deeper understanding of really what it means to be a Korean natural farmer and to utilize and harmonize with indigenous microorganisms to feed our plants and the agroecology of the soil. So what we're going to start with is just a quick presentation on PowerPoint, which will give you guys a little bit of an insight into the history of Korean natural farming and a quick walkthrough of some of its utilizations, how it interacts in the soil microbiology with macro and micro arthropods, as well as with fungi and bacteria. Then we'll dive a little bit more into how you actually make some of the recipes. Then we'll go, like Doug had said, to the Q&A, and then I'm going to give you guys a hands-on experience of a FFJ, fermented fruit juice, and an FPJ, which is a fermented plant juice. These are in essence the basic fermentations which we would utilize for both vegetative stages and flowering stages or fruiting stages of different plants. Can everyone hear me clearly enough? Excellent. I apologize. There is a droning in the background. I'm sitting outside at a house in the Cape and the next door neighbor has decided to use a engine. So unfortunately I can't do anything about that but hopefully it's not too distracting. So this is an introduction to Korean natural farming which is a regenerative form of agriculture which focuses on the cultivation and thriving of indigenous microorganisms, macro and micro arthropods, specifically focused on fungi and bacteria. Korean natural farming was first developed and really not even developed, but brought to Korea by Master Cho Han Yu. He went and had realized that the farming methods that were currently being utilized in Korea were falling, in his opinion, subpar, and he could see that they were doing damage. So he decided that he wanted to go to Japan and actually learn from some of the Japanese natural farmers who utilized methods that are very similar to what is now known as Korean natural farming. But then he brought it back to his home and he modified it so that it would actually fit into his geosphere and where he lived. And it would actually interact better with his soil microbiology. Because something that a lot of people forget about when they think about agronomy in general or agriculture as a whole is that it's very location specific. Agriculture in the south of France is extremely different than agriculture on the Cape where I am right now, which is different than agriculture in Canada. And when you start taking out conventional agricultural methods and you start utilizing regenerative agricultural methods, it becomes even more location specific because our number one workers that show up every single day Quiet. are our indigenous microorganisms. And these indigenous microorganisms have evolved over time to learn to thrive in the specific locations that they originate. So if you take organisms from where I am in the Cape and you were to take them to Colorado, they would function but they would not thrive. And they would actually be outcompeted by the indigenous microorganisms that were already present there because they've already evolved to thrive in that atmosphere and in that environment. So when Master Cho brought this back to Korea, at first, 
a lot of people laughed at him and they didn't really think it was viable. But over time, he refined it and he converted it to their cultural methodologies and it became a thriving, incredible educational location. Now, my teacher, Chris Trump, actually went there and learned from Master Cho Han Yu. He is the first person to really bring Korean natural farming in whole and in essence to America and to Western culture. Chris is a phenomenal teacher, a truly insightful human being, and an absolutely amazing agroecologist. He took what I thought was uh, honestly a little bit too hard to believe when I started learning about Korean natural farming. I've been in regenerative farming for 15 years, but I've only done Korean natural farming for the past three. And when you think about it in its essence and you start thinking that you no longer have to feed plants and that you can only simply utilize things like fermented plants, fermented fruits, and indigenous microorganisms, and that's gonna replace fertilizer and for the most part, IPM structures, it sounds almost ludicrous and too good to be true. But when I first went to Chris's five day intensive course, I was skeptical, but hopeful. By the second day, he had provided me with enough scientific evidence, enough studies that he had done, enough data and science that I was very, very interested. And by the fifth day, I was all about it. It is a truly incredible style of growing, but more than that, it changes your perspective on the world around you and our interactions within that world and the effects that we have. So it all starts with, as I've been saying, IMO, indigenous microorganisms. These are our workers that show up every single day. They're never sick. They never go in late. They don't care if it's raining. They work 24 seven and they are phenomenal. They will take soil that is really depleted and rejuvenate it and bring it back to life and mine minerals out of it and make readily available plant nutrients but you have to give them an environment that they can work with it. So the first thing we do is what you'll see right here. This little box is a cedar box that is about 10 inches by 10 inches. It is our IMO capture box. We take rice, preferably white rice. Honestly, the most processed rice you can get is better because it is a more readily available food source for the microorganisms. They don't have to break down the coating agents and the lectins to try to get through. So the better thing is, processed white rice. You're going to mix it with a little bit of an FPJ and a little bit of salt, uh, fermented salt water and you're going to boil it and you're going to cook it al dente. We don't want it mushy. We really still want it to have some structure to it. You're going to let it cool. Then you place it inside of this cedar box which we have drilled holes through the bottom and the sides on. You actually will want airflow. We want indigenous microorganisms to be able to get into this box and harness the food source that we've provided for them and therefore be able to populate. The very important thing about it though is as you see on the top of this box, it's not sealed. It actually has a wire mesh that we stapled down so that animals couldn't get into it and eat the rice because they'll enjoy it as well, not just the microorganisms. So you want to set this out in the forest. You're going to want to be conscious when you set this out of what your environment is like. You don't want to set it out right before a rainstorm and you don't want to set it out immediately after when it's still soaking wet. You want it to be moist but not too wet and you want it to be warm. As we all know microbes are very dependent on temperature. So when it's hot out this will happen much faster versus when it's cooler. So here it was in the fall. We placed this box in the woods near a mycelial activity. Now that means when you're looking through the woods and you see fallen branches and maybe leaf cover and you move it aside and you see little bits of white strands. Those are mycelium, which is actually structures of fungi. That's a very good place to find healthy, active diversity of microorganisms. So you're gonna nestle that box right in there where you find that good mycelial activity. You can even take little strands of the mycelium and place it in along the rice itself to even further inoculate it. Now it's going to take anywhere from one to roughly seven days, depending on temperature. If it's cooler, as I said, it'll take longer. And if it's warmer, it'll happen more rapidly. But you'll come back and check on your box every day. And when you start to see fungal blooms, little fuzzy balls shaping, colors starting to form, blues, greens, reds, purples, pinks, that's when you'll start to see biodiversity. Now, if you have a capture that only has one color, or one dominant thing that has taken it over that is unfortunately a most likely non-viable capture for what we're going to use it for, but it's still great for your compost pile. But what we're really looking for here is an equal 
amount of biodiversity. We want as many different populations as is possible. So after we have that IMO capture, we move forward. Now, this is, as I was saying, the three separate mycelial captures. What we did was we did three different types. We did one in a wooded area, one under a log, and one in the middle of a field area. So these mycelial captures that we found, the one on the left has actually turned this birch wood blue. So that mycelial activity has created a dye, which has actually changed the coloration of the wood, which was once white. The center photo is a perfect example of the mycelial fibers that I was talking about. So those are what we're looking for when we're looking in the woods. And then the final one on the right hand side is just some very interesting little fungal blooms that are actually blue and they're very small, almost leaf shaped. All three of these are good specimens that show you that you've got biodegradation happening in the area and you've got uh, fungal and bacterial activities. So our IMO capture in the picture that you had seen in the beginning, Chris had actually set that out for the class a few days before we got there so that when we arrived, we'd be able to see the capture already fully bloomed and blossomed and we're able to utilize it for our harvest. So as you can see at the bottom here of another capture that we had, there's actually mycelial blooms and fungal blooms coming through the bottom in little foam, little tiny, they look like fuzzy heads. That was a phenomenal mycelial capture. We had a really good, healthy IMO population. So as I was saying, we're gonna to get to the fermentations and this is where IMO really starts to change. We now take that box that we have of rice with all these different colors and little fuzzy areas and we're going to mix it 50-50 by weight with brown sugar. So what you're going to do is you're going to take your rice and pour it out of the box onto a food scale and weigh that. Now you're going to take that number and you're going to pour out an equal amount of brown sugar. You're going to mix these two together by hand, trying to really emulsify and get the sugar spread evenly throughout the mixture. The reason for this is that brown sugar will actually create molecular bonds with the remaining moisture molecules in the rice. What that does is it's actually taking away a food source for the microbes which we have captured. They need water to be able to create the activities that they have to to throw. Oh, the engine is ended. So they actually need these water particles to be able to create the reactions that they need to propagate and multiply and digest and create their exudates. So when we mix them with brown sugar in high enough volume, it takes away all of that moisture from them and they're left without that food source. And so it actually puts them into a state of stasis. It puts them to sleep almost. So if you look down in the bottom right hand corner here of the picture, you'll see this big jar with a white paper towel and a silver cap. This is my IMO capture that I took and then mixed with brown sugar and put into a mason jar. We do that to, like I said, keep it in stasis until we need to use it. All of these fermentations that you see in this picture are technically in stasis right now until they are needed as tools. As Korean natural farmers, all of our fermentations are not the answer. They are simply tools. They are different ways to respond to and elicit reactions. So don't think of them like the ultimate fertilizers. Think of them as individual tools in your toolbox. And it's better to have, instead of just one tool, a whole bunch of different tools, and then they can work together to make the job a lot easier. So the fermentations that I have made here, just to run through for you quickly, is FPJ, which is a fermented plant juice, which is right here. And then this is an FPJ, which is actually finished. And that's why it's got a hard cap, because it's in stasis. The next one is a WCAP, which is water soluble activated phosphorus which is in this jar right here. Then there's WCA, water-soluble calcium, which is in this jar here. And we've got fermented salt water, OHN, which stands for Oriental Herbal Nutrient, which is sort of think of it like the immuno booster of the Korean Natural Farming Toolkit, as well as a really all around phenomenal mix of six different very, very solid herbs. It's actually great for our own digestion. 
and good for our own immuno health. An interesting little side note is that every single thing you create in fermentations in Korean natural farming can be eaten. And in fact, a lot of them are delicious. I make vinaigrettes and simple syrup style things from FPJs and FFJs all the time. In fact, this jar right here, front and center, is a ginger and garlic fermentation, which I made exclusively for cooking. It's not for my plants, it's only for us because it is so delicious. The next is IMO1, which is that first capture of IMO like we had discussed. Then labs, which is lactobacillus serum. We use lactobacillus in Korean natural farming for a multitude of things, but predominantly we utilize it to stabilize fermentations and we utilize it as a powerhouse of bacteria, which is extremely good in IPM and in beating out other pathogenic um, bacteria or fungi, and in also helping to really break down and revitalize soil. Then we use brown sugar, like I said, for making water molecules no longer available in our fermentations once they're ready, as well as in our IMO captures. Then we have ripe white rice to get our IMO captures. And then what's interesting is you can even reuse your FPJ solids and your FFJ solids after your extraction for the fermentation, and you can make vinegars and alcohols. So this was my capture. This was the white rice, which I had placed into my jar after six days in the backyard of my house near an oak tree. I had pinks, I had purples, I had reds, I had yellows, I had greens, and I had fuzzy mycelial activity, mostly throughout the entire capture. And now something that's very important is that you should label things. So as I said here, this is my IMO2 now, which just means you took your IMO1, which is the capture, and you've mixed it with brown sugar, becomes IMO2. The date, where I found it was wood chips and around the garden, and then different characteristics, which you can define it by, as well as up here though, it's cut off in the picture, the season and whether it was wet or dry. Your bacterial and fungal dominances and ratios of populations change daily. So you may think that, well, the IMO that I got this week is gonna be the same IMO that I'll get in a month or two in the same space. But in all honesty, they actually change pretty substantially. So getting multiple IMO captures from multiple locations during multiple seasons is a very good way to even further increase your biodiversity when taking it to the next stage and making an IMO three, four, and five. So the inputs for Korean natural farming are, hang on, just one second, I have to move this over. The inputs for Korean natural farming is always about using what's readily available. When you have an FPJ that you're going to make, like we are going to make today, with this purslane, which I pulled from the farm, which I am currently running on the Cape, this is a weed to us. It is everywhere, it is pervasive, and there's nothing that I can do to stop it. So it's a perfect food source for my plants because this plant has naturally evolved to thrive in the conditions that are already readily available on my farm. They like the soil, they like the water, they like the air, they like the atmosphere, they like the humidity. All of those things, as well as what's readily available as far as macro, micronutrients, and fungal to bacterial dominances, are making this plant very happy, which means it's going to be a fantastic bioaccumulator and it's going to already have the macro and micronutrients that your plants are going to need to thrive in the same environment. So the weeds that you've been fighting for years are now going to become your new fertilizer source. The next thing is a fermentation from fruits, which we are going to be using some French breakfast radishes, which I harvested from the farm today, which have overgrown their size. They were left in field too long. And so now they've become a little woody, a little spongy, not quite the variety to last this long. They've even got a little hole that's gone down the center now because they're beginning to expand and create air pockets. So no longer great for consumption, but a phenomenal source of nutrition for our plants to be used as a fruit. So most people would not think of this as the fruit. Technically, as far as the plant is concerned, this is the vegetative portion and this is its fruiting body. 
even though it's not, you know, an apple, a pear, or a peach, like we would think of with really high sugar contents, which are also phenomenal sources for FFJs. So as I had said before, we have OHN. These are the beginnings of OHN. We have garlic, we have ginger, we have licorice root, then we have angelica root, and we have cinnamon bark. I really wanted to put this one in here specifically because of cold seasons and all of those sorts of things. When you have any sort of tickle in your throat or any sort of digestive unhappiness or question, a little bit of OHN has really done wonders for me. And um, it is a really fantastic ancient uh, Chinese, actually, herbal medicine that's just based off of immuno boosters and appetite set. And it's great for our plants. So you can actually, as I said earlier, make vinegar and alcohol from your FFJ and FPJ remnants. When we make our fermentation, we will have solids that are left over afterwards when we've removed and strained our liquids. Those solids would normally be great for the compost pile, but if you'd like, you can actually make them into something also useful. All you have to do is take the solids, fill the jar back up with water, and then hard seal it versus soft sealing. Hard sealing is a solid steel cap, so it becomes airtight and it creates an anaerobic environment, where soft sealing would be, let's say, a paper towel or cheesecloth or t-shirt cloth that allows oxygen to pass through, so it's actually an aerobic environment. And you can do that to make either an alcohol or a vinegar, and they both take about six months. So this is my FFJ turning into an alcohol on the left-hand side. And I'm using a CO2 burp valve from brewing beer that I've put directly into my steel cap. So it creates an anaerobic environment, but it is actually also allowing the alcohol's fumes that are being created to off gas so that we don't create pressure inside of here. Because if this blows up in your fermentations cabinet, it will not be fun to clean up. And on the right hand side here, we see an FPJ, which we have vinegar added. So you're going to take the solids and fill it back up with water. And then you're going to add just a little bit of a mother vinegar, preferably one that has a SCOBY to it. But if not, one that at least is an organic solid base vinegar, something like an apple cider vinegar is a phenomenal choice in my opinion. Now we start getting into some of the more difficult, in my opinion, to believe that they really, it's just, it's tough. FAA. Fermented fish amino acids. So when I tell you that this is going to smell like strawberries and taste like teriyaki sauce, you're going to tell me I'm crazy. And that's totally fine because that's exactly what I told my teacher. And then I sat down and I ended up having dinner in this dining room and there was a five gallon cooler of fish amino acids in the corner that was lit open and I had no idea the entire time. But what fish amino acid is, it is the waste products of fish, not to be confused with an emulsion or a hydrolysate. An emulsion is when you take the carcasses of a fish, you allow them to be boiled down, you scoop the remnant oils off of the top, which are then usually utilized for fish oil additives or fish oil vitamins, and then they sell you the sludge that's left afterwards. It's a decent fertilizer, but you've lost a lot of the truly beneficial things for growth of plants. You've lost all of your uh, amino chain acids, you've lost all of your proteins, you've lost all of your fatty acids and omega oils, and therefore you're left with basically just a really rancid smelling, nasty, nasty black liquid. The hydrolysate is the same process, but they leave that layer at the top of the fatty oils and omega threes. Now that is key because fungi love oils and fats. That is one of their favorite things to feed on. And in healthy plant environments, we are looking to have a fungal over bacterial dominance because we really want those fungi to thrive. We want to give them these oils and amino acids and proteins to feed on. Now the next step further than a hydrolysate is a fish amino acid, which is a very rare thing and I've only really come across it in Korean natural farming. So what we do is we take some fish heads, guts, bones, scales, tails, fins, 
all the parts that you don't want to eat. Please don't waste the beautiful fillets. Enjoy those yourself. Your plants will not appreciate them anywhere near as much as you will. And then we're going to chop them up. And we are going to mix them. As you see on the left here, like in all things in Korean natural farming, we mix them equally with brown sugar. But then we're also going to layer in, as you see here in the bottom left-hand corner, some leaf duff and compost and a little bit of IMO, like you see here on the right-hand side. So we're taking fish, chopping it up, mixing it with brown sugar, essentially adding bits of compost and you know, detritus, rotting leaves, and then we're also going to mix in a little bit of indigenous microorganisms. And we're going to lasagna this inside of a cooler, and then we're going to let it sit with the lid open for six months to a year. And it's going to smell not at all. To me, when I first heard that, I thought it was absolutely ludicrous. I mean, to, I've smelled what fish smells like in the fridge after, you know, one or two days past where it should be not mixing it with compost and detritus and indigenous microorganisms and brown sugar and then leaving it at room temperature. To me, that just absolutely sounded bonkers. But there's this incredible reaction that happens. And as I said, in the end, it will actually smell like strawberries and it tastes like a phenomenal teriyaki sauce. And if you think about it in Korean culture, they do something similar to this naturally for their own cooking. They create something called fish sauce. It's actually prevalent in a lot of the Asian cultures and Oriental cooking. So this is probably one of the hardest things to get over, in my opinion, in Korean natural farming. That's one of the reasons like, I like to save it for the end after people are like, OK, chop up plants, chop up fruits. This makes sense. Maybe a little bit of seawater. That seems a little odd, but there's minerals in there and there's the natural microbiome of the aquatic areas as well. So that's not too crazy. And then you start stepping a little further and we're like, okay, lactobacillus, we're gonna add bacteria. It seems a little counterintuitive, but still I'm with you. But then you start talking about fish and compost and it, it just loses most people. But this is really one of the best things that you can use actually for IPM, as well as truly nitrogen rich fertilizers for your soil. Now we start stepping into some of the rarer used but equally useful um, fermentations, such as WCAP, water-soluble phosphorus, and WCA, water-soluble calcium. Water-soluble phosphorus, we derive from large animal bones. So we used beef bones, preferably something like the ankle shanks or calf shanks. They're very thick, very solid bones, lots of good marrow in the interior. You're gonna take these bones and we're gonna scorch them. We're going to create what's known as a rocket stove. Essentially, you have a steel bucket that you flip with its bottom up and you cut the top out. Then you take another bucket and you put it over the same direct, uh, the opposite direction. So it's tops facing up and it's bottoms down. You drill a bunch of holes in the bottom of that box. So when you create the fire in the bottom one, it funnels like a cone and then it feeds into the second bucket where it flares out like a funnel. So we put the fire in the bottom bucket and we put the bones in the top. We allow that to scorch for, depending on how much beef and how hot you get, I mean, beef bone and how hot you get your fire, anywhere from one to two hours or so. And the real key is we're waiting till these bones crack. We need them to really, really crack and blacken. The other thing that you can use is sunflower heads. But the key with sunflower heads, unlike the beef bones, is you have to keep them in an oxygen deprived environment, like a hard uh, cast iron kettle with a really solid fitting lid. The reason for that is that to get them to the level where they scorch, they will also combust. And if there's oxygen present, then they will combust and you'll just have a bunch of burned sunflower heads instead of scorched, where the bones will not combust, they will only scorch. So here's an example on the left here of a rocket furnace that we built. Like I said, it's just a bucket that's upside down and then it's lid and then a bucket that's right side up and there's holes drilled in the bottom of this one and the bottom is cut out of this lower one. We then chopped up some small pieces of wood. You feed them in the bottom here, start the fire, place the second bucket on top and then walk away. The smoke that comes off of this is rancid. Burning marrow is not a lovely smell. So I recommend doing this outside a little ways away from your home. Maybe get together with a group of friends, do it together, because you won't need a whole lot of the beef bones. Honestly, a few beef bones will make more water-soluble phosphorus than most of you will need in a year or two. 
So you can get together and do this as a group and therefore share the work and then share the effort. So you only have to make one stink. On the right hand, you see a cast iron pot, like I was talking about, with a very tight fitting lid and a bunch of sunflower heads. They're dry, but not dried all the way. They're just not fresh green harvested. They were probably about four days old, cut off of the plant. And then we made it for a small fire and you set that on top also until they've blackened. But like I said, make sure you leave the cap on. Otherwise you will have combustion and you will lose the, the uh, phosphorus that you're looking to gain. So now we can create an IMO3. When you take your IMO1, which is the capture, you create an IMO2, which is where you blend it with the brown sugar. Now we create an IMO3. An IMO3 is taking this indigenous microorganisms that we have captured and then placed into stasis and now giving them the chance to multiply. So what that means really is we're going to provide them with food sources and water. So we're going to take our IMO capture. We're going to take some rice bran, some rolled oats, and some wood chips not fresh green wood chips, preferably some aged wood chips. You want them to not be super nitrogen rich. They're, it'll just be a little bit more difficult for your pile to really take off. And we're gonna mix these together and make a homogenized mix of the rice bran, the rolled oats, and the wood chips, equal parts. Then we're going to mix a little bit of fermented salt water and fermented plant juice with our IMO2. So we're going to sprinkle that IMO2 into the bucket with this salt water mixed with regular water mixed with a little bit of FPJ. We're going to swirl that all up and we're going to start to mix that into the pile. Very gently mixing it all together, really making sure it's a homogenized, equally moisturized mix. Now the key is that we want it to be just moist enough that when you clump a handful together, it means, remains together, much like a soil moisture test. But we don't want it to be dripping water out and we don't want it to be powdery in our hands. So we want just sort of that optimal range of soil moisture is pretty prevalent, I mean, it's pretty accurate to the level of moisture we want for the pile. Then we're gonna take this pile, this mix, and we're gonna create a circle, and we're gonna plateau the top of it. And we're gonna make it about three to four inches tall, depending on how big of a pile you make, you can make it taller. If you make it taller, you will gain heat faster. If you make it smaller and shorter, you will gain heat slower. Now the key here is that over the next three days, we want to maintain a thermal temperature of about 130 degrees. Unlike thermal composting, where you go over 140 to kill pathogens, we want to maintain as much biodiversity as possible. So we want the good guys to outcompete the bad guys, not to sterilize the bad guys by raising the temperature so high that it kills off everything. So really the key is 130 degrees, and you can flip your pile and move your pile shape to maintain that temperature because those mo both of those actions will lower your temperatures and building your pile up will raise your temperatures. But the goal is to really try to maintain that 130 and to move it as little as possible to really allow that mycelial and bacterial growth inside there from the IMO capture to spread and propagate and create huge, beautiful blooms. And they're gonna feed so rapidly, it's incredible. Within the first day, you'll start to see temperatures at the end of 24 hours. You'll see temperatures rising. At the end of the first 24 hours, you need to flip once. At that point, you can either leave it alone if your temperatures stay well, or you can spread it or pile it as needed, or flip it if you need to one more time. If it's really still hot out. If it's it really still hot out. Now, one of the major things is that when you're doing this, like your IMO capture, it is temperature dependent of your environment. So when you're outside, you need to be aware that if you're in 75, 80 degree temperatures and it's really humid, this can happen really, really quickly. And it can happen almost too quickly. You need to keep an eye on it to make sure that those temperatures don't spike on you. When we did it for my class with Chris, it was actually quite cold, it was the fall. So it took us about four days to really have a solid bloom. And we maintained temperatures at right about 130s. And in some of our cases, actually, the piles didn't quite get warm enough at around 120s. And we ended up learning from that experience. <clears throat> so a side note that's pretty fun about IMO 
and I really don't understand the science behind it, which for me is something frustrating because I love to understand the science behind things. That's one of the reasons why I love Korean natural farming is that it really is starting to have science behind it. But an IMO pile, this is an IMO3 pile, is very common and is so warm, it feels like a heavy blanket. So something that's nice to do is what we call the IMO foot spa. And basically you just scooch up to the IMO pile and you bury your legs in it up to your knees or at can, um, calves or ankles and you just relax for a little while. And it truly is amazing just how calming and relaxing of an experience that this can be. And as you'll see here, two of our fellow instructors in training got fully submerged in the IMO piles. We buried them like mummies and they fell asleep and took really nice naps, they said. And we actually ended up having almost every day at the end of our five days, we went to the IMO pile. And that was how we ended our day. It was an hour just sitting around the IMO pile with our feet warm. And it just detoxes and it de-stressed us so well. And we just had beautiful conversation around the nice pile. And it's got this really nice, rich, earthy smell to it. The wood chips, the rice bran, and the rolled oats, along with the natural fermentation, I mean, the natural uh, mycelia and bacterial growths that sort of just smell like forest. It's, it's a surprisingly enjoyable experience when you think about what you're actually doing. So now these are the references that I utilize and I recommend for if you want to look more into Korean natural farming. The Hawaii, um, what is it, the, I don't remember the actual institute name, but it was a conjunction between the University of Hawaii and an institute there. And they did a phenomenal study on Korean natural farming and its impact on indigenous microorganisms. So if you're looking for something that's a little bit more white paper style, in-depth clinical research onto what Korean natural farming can actually do, that is a phenomenal resource. And then also I would recommend that you look at naturalfarming.co, which is the website of my mentor and teacher, Chris Trump, who is the founder of naturalfarming.co in the United States and is a truly, truly amazing, amazing teacher and just advancing this, uh, this interesting style of cultivation for us all around the world. And that comes to the end of my presentation as far as the PowerPoint goes. Do we have any questions yet? Thanks, Ben. So far, nothing has come up in the chat. Are there any questions? on the burning questions at the top of your heads. Yeah, hey. Nina? Hey, um, thanks so much for the talk. That was super uh, informative and really fun to listen to. Um, I'm wondering about the, you said that it's one-to-one -one, um, brown sugar to the inoculated rice when you're trying to make yes, the- by weight. Yeah, by weight. Okay, that was my question. Awesome. Yes. Um, thank Always you. one-to-one -one by weight. Okay, one-to-one -one by weight, awesome. And I'm wondering if you could kind of just like at a high level go over like what the steps are because I feel like you gave a list um, of like all the acronyms and everything and it said what they were but then how they but then you kind of like when I, I just felt it was a little quick to no, um, no, you're, you're get completely through like which part goes where so I'm wondering if you could just be like okay FPJ and FFJ are like they then turn into the OHN later when you add vinegar like that's kind of where I'm not a problem so I did breeze over it very quickly the reason for that is that we would be here for about four hours to go through all of them. For sure. It's a very in-depth um, education. That's why it took us 40 hours to really learn enough of it to be able to teach others. But at a high level, FPJ is chopped up plants, the vegetative growth mixed one-to-one -one with brown sugar, and then allowed to ferment for about seven days in a um, soft sealed container, usually a ball jar. FPJ, or sorry, FFJ is chopped up fruits mixed with brown sugar and then put in the ball jar, same as an FPJ, soft seal. Then OHN is a combination of these six different, or sorry, five different herbs that are fermented for six months. That is its own endeavor of its own. It's five different extractions, it's every 14 days. So that is something that I breeze over. I just let people know that it exists and that it has a utilization for immunoboosting as well as it really helps make food more available in the microbial atmosphere for the plant. It just sort of increases the symbiotic relationship and how well they transfer back and forth. I don't understand the science yet behind that and I haven't had it quantified, 
but I am looking into it more and we're doing a lot of research on scoping to try to figure out exactly what interplay it has. It's just very prevalent in the fact that it works well and it's utilized in a lot of our um, preparations. But it is not an FPJ or an FFJ. It is the ginger, garlic, cinnamon, angelica, and licorice root. And that is the only thing actually that we utilize alcohol for. All of our other preparations are fermentations. That's the only one where we do a fermentation and then an alcohol extraction. And that's also why it takes six months. And we have 14 days between each extraction to allow that alcohol to really pull the essential oils out of the herbs and barks. Then the water soluble calcium, <laughs> potassium and phosphorus are all their own extractions. They're actually acid extractions. So we do the beef bone for the phosphorus, we do eggshells for the calcium, and we do the sunflower heads for the potassium. And then each of those is mixed with a vinegar to do an acid extraction from there. I just saw a question pop up in the chat. Suzanne has a question. Gotcha. Go ahead, um, Suzanne. Did that finish answering your question, Nina? <laughs> Uh, yeah, thanks so much. I well, I also saw the SW on the list, and I was curious. I don't know if salt I saw water. salt water. Got it. Okay, thanks. Yep. Yeah, I I had a question. Um, I'm Suzanne Suzanne Hale. Thank you so much for doing this. My pleasure. And my question is, I'm I'm doing agroforestry, so I'm working with trees. Yes. Um, and I wanted to find out if um doing your, your starter box in an old growth forest, whether that would be helpful <laughs> to get a whole range of microorganisms. Yes, 100%. An old growth forest would be a phenomenal location for IMO captures. Great. We don't know why, but for some reason, oak trees seem to provide some of the best diversity of captures. Interesting. And if you're able to find an oak grove with a few felled trees or downed branches, I promise you, you will find a wealth of biodiversity. Great. Thank you. It's probably no coincidence that oak trees also support the widest diversity of beneficial insects. That's right. Yeah. There are a couple of questions. One sort of, um, would we be able to get those slides from yes. you? Yes, I'm happy to provide that. And then um, someone, Anita asked about uh, Jadam. Jadam, oh, very... so Jadam is an offshoot from Korean natural farming. It was actually created by Cho Han Yu's son, and it's how best to describe. Korean natural farming is when you have inputs available to you, when you can source brown sugar, when you can source salt water, when you can source fruit and plants and clean water, and you can really actually have access to a few basic essentials. Jadam is when you have nothing. When you are in a desolate desert or an area that has just been devastated and it, there, there's nothing available to you, that's when you can utilize Jadam most specifically. Jadam has applications, in my opinion. Um, I think that the IPM spray from Jadam, the microbial solution, is actually one of the best IPM methodologies I've ever used. And um, my mentor, Chris, actually was the one that turned me on to it, and it's, it's fantastic. I use it over uh, basically I know, over any other IPM methodology. But as far as an overall cultivation style, I like Jadam. It's a phenomenal emergency rescue style. So if you're, you know, in sub-Saharan Africa and you have no supplies, no access to anything, then you can utilize Jadam and you can get somewhere with it and you can bring some soil rejuvenation back and bring some microbial life back to the environment. But it, in my opinion, personally, does not compete quite on the same level as Korean natural farming, Simp as far as increasing biodiversity, increasing um, fertility and growth. And the reason for that is that one utilizes fermentation, which is aerobic, and the other one utilizes putrefaction, which is anaerobic. So Janam has, it's all about rot. It's all about putrefac putrefaction and um, degradation. And so it breaks the things down but it breaks them down in a different manner in an anaerobic environment versus fermentation, which is the Korean natural farming way, which uses live microorganisms that are breathing oxygen and off gassing. And it just creates a different atmosphere. For the fish amino acid, how would you know when it's done and how do you store it? 
So how do you know when it's done? Um, it takes about six months and you can go all the way up to a year. You'll know when it's done for the most part because all of those solids, it'll turn into just black liquid. The whole thing just turns into dark, dark liquid and all the bone breaks down for the most part. Though when you finish, I recommend giving it a loose straining um, just to pull some of the major solids out so that they don't continue to break down. And also so that way when you utilize it as a foliar spray or a soil drench, you don't have chunks. As far as how to store it, you can either maintain it in a fridge, either with or without a lactobacillus stabilizer, or you can maintain it on a shelf with brown sugar and just keep it. it, it you're going to use it pretty minimally, so don't make massive, massive batches. Is oily fish better to use than white fish? Not really. Uh, at least not in my experience, it's not drastically better. I mean, I would say that to some extent, but don't go chasing the oiliness. It's more about the microbes than it is about the fish. That said, salt fish is better than freshwater fish. That is something that has been taught to be by my professor and my, uh, my mentor, that for some reason, saltwater fish is definitely a better choice than freshwater fish. Mm. So the small batches result in the huge IMO3 bill. The reason for that is that it's all about inoculation. So a small amount of IMO can inoculate a massive pile. When you blend it thoroughly, provide food sources, water, and a good environment, they will populate. Even if they're in little microscopic little pockets of fungi and bacteria, they will begin to all populate and become a huge mass again. So the huge IMO pile that you saw was about 6,000 pounds. And we created that from an IMO capture that was probably about one gallon in the end. It was, it was just, you know, one big box. Yes, I am becoming more and more involved with microscopy and learning the art form of microscopy. I'm not anywhere near as advanced as I would like to be in it, and I am not anywhere near as much time as I would like to dedicate to it. I would really like to be able to learn more about the colonies of bacteria and fungi and the different dominances that I'm seeing. But unfortunately, my work as a consultant, um, as well as a teacher, as well as running a 230 acre farm and then my own home farm has not left me with much time to advance my studies on microscopy. Any other questions? Or would you like me to move forward into the hands-on portion? I think let's move forward. All right, so let's start with an FPJ. So we start with a ball jar, a freshly harvested vegetative growth plant that is preferably as indigenous to your site as possible. Oh, actually speaking of though, really quickly, something that I missed. When harvesting IMO, altitude is good. The higher the altitude, the better. But you need to harvest only within roughly 50 miles of the location you plan to utilize it in. Because as I said, they are truly indigenous microorganisms. There are microclimates that change within a few miles. And that means the microbiology changes. So don't think I'm going to go to the top of Mount Washington and get the best IMO capture ever and then bring it back down to Rhode Island and it's going to be the best because it, it'll work, but it's not going to be actually better than what you could get two blocks down the road at the park. Can I actually ask about that? So if you're um, like right by the ocean, you know, you're not going to like, there's not going to be too many mountains or anything here. So like how, how important is the altitude? It is important, but it is not crucial. If you have the option to harvest an IMO capture from down the hill where you've lost maybe 50 to 100 feet of altitude or up the hill where you've maybe gained 50 to 100 feet of altitude, go up the hill. But if it's a matter of, you know, taking a hike to try to get 50 miles away and you only get a couple of feet of elevation, it's not worth your time. It's better to get a, a close and really healthy indigenous microorganism capture from your own backyard or the local forest than to get something that's really elevated. Sure. Okay, thanks. Not a problem. 
Um, I do see another question there, though. Uh, can I comment on yield after using KNF? Hmm. So I have utilized conventional agriculture. I've been a bottle grower. I've worked my way all the way across to organic cultivation and now sustainable agriculture and then worked my way into regenerative agriculture. The results that I have seen with Korean natural farming are incredible. They are truly staggering. And that is what got me to drop what I was doing and completely change my style of cultivation. In one year, I went from running multiple operations that were all semi-synthetic, mostly organic, about 80% organic, 20% synthetic, but chelated nutrients nonetheless. And it really, really shifted. And in one cultivation cycle, I went completely to Korean natural farming. And now I don't use anything except that. I've got shelves of chemicals sitting at my house that I have no clue what I should do with because I have no use for them anymore. Not as IPM, not as boost, boosters for growth, not as cloning gels, nothing. It's, it's really incredible when you just harmonize and harness the power of nature and indigenous microorganisms and lose the hubris to think that we know what's best and start simply following in the footsteps of what nature is already pre-designed for us. It, it's, I've never gotten such great results with so little work and with so little money spent. Bokashi buckets and then incorporating them into my compost. Is this a similar process? Bokashi is a beautiful thing. It's a, a fantastic supplement. It is not in Korean natural farming. It is not a portion of Korean natural farming, but it is, I would say, in the same genre. It is a fermentation style. It is harnessing microbes and it is utilizing microbes to further the potential of soil and harmonize with the plants. The real key with utilizing Bokashi is don't use it as a standalone utilize it as a supplementation. So it can be a great tool that you can add into your Korean natural farming tool belt. I have a lot of people that I know who are both Korean natural farmers and just farmers in general that utilize Bokashi and utilize individual Korean natural farming implements. You don't have to adopt this as a be all end all and you don't have to adopt this as your replacement 100%. You can pick and choose and you can select that, you know, I'm gonna stick with what I'm doing, but I really like the results that I got from that FPJ and that FFJ. And I really liked how instead of using a chelated calcium, which is almost always a calcium magnesium supplement, which really doesn't actually work well together in, in plant uptake, they should be individual. Then maybe you decide that you like the calcium uptake from water soluble calcium instead. Or maybe you simply decide that you like the fact that you can create all of your own amendments from waste products from your own life that you have. Instead of throwing them out, you can utilize them. Instead of having weeds that you have to fight with, they're your fertilizer source. So it's not so much the fact that it is a perfect cycle as that it is just a vastly improved cycle, in my opinion, to everything else that I've come across. And, and I've, I've worked internationally and it's really incredible to see what this, is, what this has as a potential. What is the altitude that is better for harvesting? I don't honestly know. I don't have that information as to what is the optimal altitude for harvest. I actually asked that question myself at my class and Chris said he would get back to me. But really the answer he had given me was anything higher than your lowest point because well, anything is better than the bottom. Well, I, was, I asked that question actually. I was wondering what specifically, what is it about the altitude that makes it a better place mm -hmm. to harvest? What so altitude, altitude impacts biodiversity and it impacts populations. Oh, okay. Yes, that would make sense. Okay. All right. So we'll start our hands-on portion because I know we're coming uh, to a half hour left. So we start with a mixing bowl, a knife, our ball jar, brown sugar, and our purslane. So a lot of people get kind of hung up on this part. They think about that they have to chop it up perfectly and they have to mix it perfectly. It's not baking. The microbes are going to do the work for us. 
the key is just to get a really homogenized mix. But when you're chopping it up, big rough cut chunks are fine. It does not need to be minced. It does not need to be finely diced or chopped. And I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm right there. I love to cook and I finely minced my garlic and my onions. Don't waste your time and energy. It'll come out just fine. But one thing to consider is you do want things that have a good water content because what we're trying to do here is extract the nutrients from within the plant. Most nutrients are mobile. If the nutrient is non-mobile, we're not going to be able to extract it very well. So something that has a large water content, the, the content of the inside the plant itself is actually gonna become the conduit that makes the mobility of that nutrient able to get out of the plant. So we're gonna chop up some of our purslane here. And as I said, really quite rough cut. Now we're going to take our ball jar. Now on our ball jar here, we have measurements. 100 milliliters, 200 milliliters, 300 milliliters, and then the top line would be four. So the key is you never fill above two thirds of the way. You need to leave an air pocket at the top. You don't want to fill it all the way up. So we're gonna fill about one third, a little over of the jar with purslane. Now I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna weigh it. So we have four and a half ounces of purslane. We're gonna pour that into our mixing bowl. Now that we have our measurement of volume, we measure out our brown sugar. Now we take our brown sugar, put some in our ball jar, we weigh it. Four point five ounces. So we've matched weights between our purslane and our brown sugar. Now we mix them. Now, when you're mixing, you want to sort of massage it a bit. You really want to, you know, break up the cellular structure of the plant matter a little bit, crunch it a little bit, really get a good mix with the brown sugar. Now we're going to take our ball jar again and we refill this mixture into the ball jar. Make sure you shake it down pretty well. We want to get a good even sample. You don't want air pockets that can mislead how much you're actually able to put in. All right, so now we've got two thirds of the jar filled with purslane and brown sugar mixed together. Paper towel. We place the paper towel over the lid, like so, creating a breathable barrier. So like I said, with the fermentations, it's very important that there is a capacity for air to transport back and forth to create an aerobic environment, not an anaerobic environment. Otherwise, we will go from fermentation to rotting, and that's not what we want to do. Now we take this, either put the steel band of the ball jar back on and screw it on without the centerpiece, or you can put a rubber band around it or use some tape. Make sure you label what you put in and what date. Then you let this sit in a dark, moderately cool, you know, like a closet or a cupboard, pantry, something like that. Let it sit for seven days. 
When you come back, there will be black liquid or dark liquid on the bottom and solid sitting on the top and a little brown sugar, maybe residual lift on the very top. You're going to pour it out, strain the solids and separate them, put the liquid back in. Then you're going to take off the cap, remove the paper towel, put the steel cap back together and screw it on so it is then sealed tight. And you can put that away to use at a later point in time. Now, one thing that you can do with certain mixtures that especially have high water content, you can do what's called a sugar cap. A sugar cap is basically a little insurance policy to make sure that the fermentation doesn't get overly active during its process of fermenting. So what you do is we have our mixture and we just put a little extra sugar right on the top. Instead of just allowing the 50-50 mixture, it creates a little sugar cap. So that top quarter inch or so, eighth inch, is solid brown sugar. Now what that'll do is it'll keep a little barrier between the oxygen and the moisture and it'll keep, it'll sort of settle down the overreactiveness if it's too much moisture that you're pulling out. Because when you get a really good plant like purslane, which is a succulent, it's got a great moisture content, which means we will have a wonderful yield of fermented plant juice from this. But it also means that we need to be a little bit more concerned about that overactivity. So we put the little sugar cap on top. Any questions on that one? All right, then I'll move on to the fermented, plant, uh, fermented fruit juice. So for this, we are going to use, like I said, the French breakfast radishes, which I harvested from our farm, which were just a little bit past, so they're a little spongy and a little woody in the interior. So a little bit past the ideal eating point, but still perfectly good for us to use as a food source for our plants. So same thing here, cut it up in nice big chunks, rough cut. You know, just quarter inch chunks or so. Now, when people think of fermented fruit juices, they always think of mangoes, peaches, apples. Those are all great sources. They have huge amounts of sugar, which is really useful, but it's not the only sources that you can have. A lot of what Korean natural farming is about is utilizing what is readily available. It's about using what's on hand in your environment. So since I don't have any fruit right now, which is rotting on the vine or on the tree, but I do have these root fruits, which are about to be passed, well, are passed for ideal eating, but are about to be passed as far as structure as well, they're a great source that I can repurpose and utilize as a good food source for my plants. And they smell good. So now we're gonna do the same thing we did before. We're going to measure and then weigh our radish. One thing to keep in mind is you do not want to utilize spicy, like peppers, hot peppers, or high citrus pineapples, oranges, things like that. Though they are fruits and though they do have sugars to them, the secondary chemical natures that are present in those particular choices can provide um, volatile reactions with the microbes and it can kill off diversity and it can have bad, bad side effects that you just don't wanna deal with. So you really wanna keep the, keep the fruits high sugar content, low citrus, low capsaicin. But the pepperiness of a radish wouldn't impact it. So we're gonna take this and measure it. These are a bit heavier than the purse lane. So we have 6.8 ounces. So now we take our brown sugar again. Measure it out. Too much. So we had 6.8 ounces of radish. We have 6.9 ounces of brown sugar. Since I know the radish has a high moisture content, I'm okay with that point one of overage on the sugar because it's not gonna hurt anything. It's only gonna help us. 
So same thing here, mix and massage, break it up a little bit. You really don't want to crush them, especially with things like apples, peaches, pears, plums, apricots, very soft shell, uh, soft tissued fruits. You can really get it squished pretty, pretty well. And you want to be careful that you don't overdo it. You're not looking to pulverize it and make applesauce. You just want to get a good mix and get a little bit of the moisture out. So unlike with the purslane, you can see that there's much more moisture in this radish and the brown sugar is actually globbing up and sticking to my hand. That tells me we need to add a little bit more. Excellent, this is gonna be a great fermented fruit juice. And I'm curious to see honestly how it'll taste because some of the ones that I've had are absolutely wonderful. So we have our mix now. And we fill our jar. Again, we are looking to achieve a two thirds fill. Ooh, they actually broke down a little more than I thought they would. So we're gonna have to add a little bit more. Don't get ben, discouraged if you yeah. the sugar source. Um, there's a question about using other types of sugar. Um, yes, yeah, so you can use any type of sugar. I find I prefer brown sugar uh, over white sugar, though personally my favorite is uh, basically unrefined sugar, like sugar in the raw. However, do not break the bank when doing this. White sugar will work just fine. It's simply that it doesn't provide as complete of a food source and as complete of a moisture pull because it's, it's lost the molasses in it. And so, I mean, brown sugar is just white refined sugar that they've reintroduced molasses to. So it's better than just plain white sugar, but really the best is an unadulterated sugar cane. You can buy, um, I know it's a little excessive for most people's uses, but you can buy 50 pounds of raw sugar for about $40. Um, you can also get, there's a brand called, I think that's Florida Crystals, and they make um, all organic uh, sugar cane and it's unrefined. It's only about, I think, $2 a pound. It's pretty reasonable. Do you ever find edible mushrooms, especially edible mycorrhizal mushrooms after switching? Yes, my, all of my beds have gone ludicrous with mushroom production. Um, not so much edibles naturally popping up, but I inoculated with oysters, reishi, shiitake, and um, wine cap, and they, they keep repropagating themselves. And they grow when I haven't planted them sometimes. I'll find them in other buckets that they sporulate and just transfer. So we're already starting to get good moisture content change here. I don't know if you can see it at the bottom of this, but that whole bottom layer is already all liquid and it's shifting back and forth. So this is gonna turn out very well. Same process again, paper towel over the lid, rubber band, tape, or the metal cap reapplied, date and label what you've put in it and when you did it. Then set it next to your FPJ in the dark room and let it sit for a few days. How many days, missed it. Nina, are you asking how many days on the FPJ, FFJ? All right, <clears throat> Doug actually answered the question. It was the how many days for the FF for the ah, FFJ? Yes. Yeah. FFJ and FPJ are both seven days. Again, however, be aware microbes are thermal dependent. If you've got 98 degree days, it's not going to take seven days. It's going to move a little bit quicker. Okay. Um, can I actually ask since I'm since I'm up um, the FFJ and FPJ? How like how do you use them differently? Like what's the so an FPJ is utilized as your vegetative stage plant food. But so something that you need to understand is that this is, this is just an introductory course. When you actually feed a plant in its vegetative stage, you're not giving it exclusively FPJ. You're giving it FPJ in a dilution of water along with some fermented salt water in a dilution 
along with some OHN in a, in a dilution, along with maybe a little bit of calcium in a dilution. And so you're making your own little blend based on what that plant needs at its stage. Then there's changeover, which is when it's going from vegetative into flowering. And then in flowering, again, you'd use some of those other fermentations, but you would replace the FPJ with the FFJ, because at that point we're utilizing the sugars content to stimulate fruiting and um, fruit body growth and flowering. Cool, thank you. Not a problem. Can you supplement brown sugar with another localized source like maple syrup? If you wanna use maple syrup and it's not gonna break your bank, go for it. But personally, my plants, I love them dearly, but they won't know the difference between brown sugar and maple syrup, but I will. So I would eat my maple syrup personally. As far as honey goes, that is a key. Honey is antimicrobial in nature. So technically you could use it. Technically it would most likely kill off some of your microbes. Also something to note when making FPJ and FFJ, don't wash your fruits. Don't wash the vegetables. You want the natural microbes that are on that surface. Now that brings up a question for people who don't have access to fresh fruits and vegetables that are not store-bought. If it's store-bought, then you should probably wash it because the only microbes left on it since it was harvested are the ones from the stock boy putting it on the shelf and maybe another customer that picked it up and decided it wasn't ready yet and they'd put it back. So the microbes you're gonna be gaining there are not the microbes that you want. Bring it home, wash it, let it sit out for a few days and gain some microbes back from the natural environment around you. Any other questions? If we're going out buying fruit, do they have to be organic? No. Though I support organic exclusively, the plants will not care. And the organic, as far as any sort of pesticides, herbicides, genetic mutation, I mean, genetic manipulation, anything like that really won't make a difference simply for the fact that the microbes will break it down. Some of the things that have been done with Korean natural farming on not just a regenerative basis, but on a rehabilitative basis, bringing contaminated soils back from being destroyed and just getting rid of absolutely eradicating herbicides and pesticides and even heavy metal contents to some extent. It's really amazing what specifically fungi can do to breaking down any chemical constituents. Anyone else have any other questions? Um, yeah, about uses. Um, from what I gather, you've got sort of like a tonic for plants and that need like a calcium boost and the phosphorus boost. And then like a general all around nutrient sort of tonic. Is Think of it like a vegetative, a flowering, and then you have the supplementive of the micronutrients of phosphorus, potassium, and, or sorry, not micro, macronutrients of phosphorus, potassium, and calcium. Oh, I see. So the FPJ uh, would be for your vegetative. vegetative. Yep, okay, and it's, it's okay. a portion of your vegetative. Think of it as the base of your vegetative. Okay. That's the basis of your vegetative blend. Okay, good. Hopefully everything will relax a little bit and we can do another class soon and I can teach you all how to make all of the actual concoctions with the fermentations. Uh, we do have one on the schedule for April 11th. So cross your fingers, everyone, that we are out of the woods in enough well, that we can hopefully we're out of the woods so we can all get together and go into the woods. Yeah. <laughs> we have a phenomenal setup for doing a hands-on Korean natural farming course where we will teach you how to do wild craft harvesting of the indigenous plants that you can utilize and then walk you through making every single one of the fermentations and you'll all get to take your fermentations home with you as well as have a laminated card that shows you how to take your fermentations and in what ratios to blend them at what different stages for plant growth. I also don't know if any of you do any livestock work, but you can actually increase your livestock's gut biome strength and decrease their methane production by increasing the amount of fermentations that they take in. So just like how 
eating things like kimchi is good for our bioflora of our guts, giving them fermentations in their food, giving them IMO inoculations in their food actually dramatically increases their immuno strengths, increases their overall health, and decreases their susceptibility to pathogens and parasites, while also making their overall gut health happier, therefore decreasing the amount of methane production that they put out. And you can use this as well on the grassland that you use to feed them. So all of your grazing lands can be dramatically increased by utilizing Korean natural farming, not just for the benefits of the micro macronutrients, but specifically the key of converting fungal to bacterial dominance in your soil. Weeds thrive in bacterially dominant soil. Grasses and vegetables thrive in fungally dominant soils. So that's why when you first rototill a field or strip something bare, the first things that come back are the weeds because the first things that grow are bacteria. Fungi take a much longer time to reestablish themselves. So by giving those fungi a leg up and like we're talking about fatty foods and things like that and increasing their microbial populations, you will actually rebalance the fungal bacterial dominance of your, of your soil, increasing the propagation of the grass and decreasing the propagation of the weeds. There's actually a cattle farmer that I've worked with that Chris worked with and he got to the point where he had to start increasing his cattle herd because he could not keep up with the grass. I'll actually leave you with one last little note. Oh, wait, uh, you say you have this store jar of FPJ. Can you add more newly made FPJ? I would not blend. Keep your FPJs separate because they will have different microorganisms from different times of capture as well as different fruits. You can blend their extracts when making a dilution to feed your plants. If you had, let's say, two different FPJs and you wanted to blend the two of them in the water, that's fine as long as you stay within the dilution ratios that you need to. But I would not blend the two jars for storage. Neither would I blend uh, IMOs, keep them separate. What else can be used as fruit? Yeah, zucchini is a fruiting body. But in, keep in mind that when we're doing FPJs, we really do wanna try to pull things that have high sugar contents. That sucrose is really beneficial to the, ferment, uh, to the fruit bearing portion of a plant's life. When it's flowering and fruiting, it really does want those high sugar contents. So though the radish that I have will work and it will be better than nothing, it would most likely not be as impactful as something that has a dramatically higher sugar content, but equally good bioaccumulation of other nutrients. You don't want something that is solely high in sugar and has nothing else beneficial in there as well. But an interesting anecdote that was one of the things that had really stuck in my mind as a story that Chris told me that was most impressive was that in Hawaii, which is where he started, his friend had 10 acres of volcanic glass, 10 acres of just a, basically nothing. There was no soil. There was not even sand. It was just inches and inches of volcanic glass. So they brought in wood chips and IMO and they spread wood chips and then sprayed IMO and then spread wood chips and then sprayed IMO. And then they started to grow corn. They grew corn on the ground, which barely made it, but they let the corn grow and it got to about three feet tall. And then they would chop it, drop it, spread another thin layer of wood chips and spray IMO and replant the corn. They did this cycle every time the corn got up to about three feet, they would chop, drop, spread a little wood chip and re-IMO within four years, they had three and a half inches of beautiful topsoil. The fungi had mined the volcanic glass and turned it into silt, sand, and uh, trace minerals. The wood chips had broken down into organic matter along with the corn, and corn is very good for this because it has that very thin hollow, I mean, uh, uh, thin hollow stalk with a big air pocket. So it creates a wonderful microbial home with individual air pockets as well as is a good source of nitrogen and just organic matter, carbon. So as far as ecology says, it takes hundreds of thousands of years for natural cycles to create inches of topsoil. They did that in four years of intensive cultivation with work with indigenous microorganisms. And to me, 
it's amazing when you can tell someone that they can save money on their production. It's amazing when you can tell someone that they can utilize waste and turn it into usable, profitable things. But when you say that we can actually do something legitimately, non-hubrously, legitimately do something using nature's power better than nature could do, simply because we're taking all of those components and bringing them together and putting them in the purpose driven ecosphere that we've, we've created for it. To me, that was astounding. The fact that we could actually harness nature's power to achieve something that powerful. Would you need some water? No, thank you so much. You're sweet. I'm all set. Lovely grandma asking me if I wanted water. Let's talk about dilutions. Okay. Um, that's a long list. The basis of it, everything is between 500 to 1,000 in dilution. So it's 1 to 500 or 1 to 1,000. But as far as what, it, it, it's a whole other class. I didn't want to get into that simply because it's the introductions portion. But each, can, each one, like let's say our initial vegetative formulation, is five different dilutions at different ratios of five different fermentations. So dip your toes before we go diving in. But come on April and you will certainly get the opportunity to not only learn the dilutions, but utilize them. And you'll get to go home with your own toolkit of Korean natural farming ferments. Did you see a couple of questions about what else can be used as fruit? And Mandy asked, why is it better to use high sugar fruiting body? So the reason that it's good to use, uh, yes, other fruits can be used. Like I was saying, zucchini, like the radishes that we used, anything that is technically a fruiting body can be used. It just needs to be the fruiting portion of the plant, not the vegetative portion of the plant. The reason that it's better to use something that has a higher sugar content is because the microbes that are utilized at that portion of a plant's growth are exchanging exudates for starches and sugars from the plant. So by providing a lot of sugars in the soil, the the microbes basically have a food source that allows them to sort of work overtime and it also allows the plant to absorb some of that sucrose and utilize it in its own production versus having to create it itself through photosynthesis. Thank you, Ben, so much for all of that, that great insight and information. All right, My have pleasure. A, a few more announcements before we wrap up. Again, as I mentioned, on April 11th, we do have a workshop scheduled. It's down in Rehoboth, Massachusetts. And if hopefully we're in a place where we can gather as a, as a good group, because I know um, all of this is really exciting and it, it's so important to you know, feel it and get a sense of the power that Ben is talking about, and how we can harness that. Thank you so much for joining us and for attending the summer conference. Thank you all for attending. I really appreciated the support. I'm glad that you were interested and hope you enjoyed the presentation.